What is up, Dodgers Nation? Uh, we are chatting today with a dear friend of ours here at Dodgers Nation, and uh, he is a former longtime Dodgers front office uh, executive who now, mercifully, is no longer the last GM to, to bring home a world championship to uh, your Los Angeles Dodgers. Welcome back, Mr. Fred Clare. How are you doing this, uh, this fine morning, Fred? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Awesome to have you, uh, Fred, right off the top. Um, how does it feel to no longer have that distinction? Uh, it feels great. It's, um, I think it's um, as it should be, certainly uh, overdue in time, uh, but I'm very uh, happy to have um, been a part of all that, but really happy for uh, the Dodger team of, um, of this year and um, a good friend, uh, wonderful friend, Dave Roberts, and for Clayton and for all the members of the team. They have been so good and have come so close. So I don't mind. Um, it <laughs> seemed a little stretch to be introduced as the last GM when it had been uh, 32 years. That was getting, uh, I think, a little tired for everyone, and yeah. I'm sure very tired uh, for the members of the uh of the Dodgers of this year. So it was time and uh, a very different season, uh, but I'm happy and uh, for all of those involved and passed along my congratulations to Andrew and to Dave and uh, uh, my congratulations to all the members of the organization. Yeah, we we waited a long time for it, Fred, but we're <laughs> yes. finally, yeah. finally, had, I that was the first one I got to see in my lifetime. So it was very exciting for me. <laughs> um, the last time we spoke, Fred, I think Major League Baseball, the Players Association, they were kind of knee deep in a little bit of a battle to try to figure out how to get the 2020 <laughs> season started. Got a little ugly for a little bit, got a little maybe too public for people's liking. But um, how did you ultimately feel about how the 2020 season played out? Obviously, you get a World Series, so you're happy about that. But aside from that. I think that with all of the uh, challenges that baseball faced and um, uh, through the, the negotiations and trying to find the path that when you look at it now at the end of the road, uh, I think you have to give a tremendous amount of credit to everyone involved. And there are those um, who have said, well, it really wasn't a, um, a regular season, so you can't judge as such. Mm -hmm. And in my view, it was even more challenging than a regular season. I, I truly feel that because I could sense, see, and feel what everyone was having to go through. Uh, so um, it's a uh, it's, it was a, a true championship and truly won. And I give credit to, um, to baseball and really to all the teams and to Major League Baseball itself because um, this could have had a very sad ending mm -hmm. and it didn't. And so you have to weigh all of the factors. I, as you know, wasn't happy early on with the uh, negotiations because my point was that it should be health first before anything. Um, is uh, agreed upon, but uh, Major League Baseball, the players got through it and uh, hopefully um, uh, can uh, learn a lot from that and uh, look forward to a um, much more normal season in 2021. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mentioning, you know, kind of sad endings, that's something Dodger fans uh, have been very used to, especially over the last five, six seasons or so, uh, maybe even closer to that. Uh, along the way, uh, your friend, manager Dave Roberts, has gotten a lot of the, the criticism from that, some of it earned, some of it not, and, and you know, he said as much that he's, he's learned and grown. Uh, just as, as, you know, you spent so long in the front office looking at, at baseball, looking at the team in so many different aspects. Um, how would you, uh, I don't know about if we're calling it grading, but how, how do you assess Doc's um, 2020 postseason and maybe in postseasons past just, uh, you know, as kind of seeing some things that he might have learned and, and ways that he's grown as a, uh, as a manager now at, heading into his sixth season? Well, I have uh, gained. Uh, so much respect for Dave. And um, 
when he was named the uh, the manager, uh, it's, what struck me was his quote. He said, uh, now he's just been named the manager. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is the organization of, um, of Jackie Robinson, of Sandy Koufax, of Fernando Valenzuela, of Hideo Nomo. And so by his words, I, I could see and feel um, the, the opportunity that he knew was his and the way that he felt about it. And um, Maury Wills, a very good friend of Dave's. And when Dave was named the manager, Maury asked if I would um, meet with Dave. And I said, um, I would be delighted to. And so it was my last winter meetings um, before cancer struck my life in 2015. As it turned out, uh, Dave was just walking out of a Starbucks there. I think we're in Nashville at that Opryland or one of those hotels that seems to have no path to any place, just kind of go around in circles. But there was Dave. And we, we had a, a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And, um, and I thought Dave, from his background, uh, tr uh, truly um, uh, was well suited. Um, he had, th there were years when he went in as a non roster player. Mm -hmm. he, he knew all of that. And, and if you really think about it, in many ways, his background was very much like, in a way, Walter Austin's or Tommy's. I mean, Dave actually had um, certainly a better major league career, if you want to co compare that, because the other two were very brief. But what 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 had what really struck me about Dave was last year when they didn't win, mm -hmm. and I think, and you guys know, set a record for number of wins in the regular season. Yeah. And um, uh, and Dave took a lot of heat. And so I, and I maybe shouldn't share it, but I will share it, that uh, I texted Dave at the end of um, 2019. And I said, Dave, your team set a record and had a tremendous season. Through all of that, I never, ever heard you take credit one time. The only thing that I have ever heard you do is to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I said, it will be a very happy day for me when I see you holding the world's championship trophy. So you know what, yeah. <laughs> what that meant from my standpoint. And I felt it in my heart and soul mm -hmm. and to see it become a um, reality uh, because Dave, you know, even in looking at Dave from a distance and you guys follow the game on a daily basis, there was a time when everybody in town wanted to run Pedro Baez out of town. <laughs> and I, I don't get to watch all the games, uh, mm -hmm. but I was watching this game after this had developed with Pedro. And I see Pedro sitting on the bench beside Dave and Dave's got his arm around him. I see Muncie, when Muncie's struggling mm -hmm. and everybody's questioning him, and where's Dave? He has his arm around him. This is what managing is all about. And this is what he has done so well. So uh, in my book, he's the uh, manager of the year and I feel very blessed. I had a close, wonderful relationship with Walter Alston and one with, of course, with my dear friend, Tommy. Mm -hmm. And now with Dave, I just feel uh, so fortunate. Uh, the only three managers to ever manage the Dodger World <laughs> Championship Club. <laughs> and I've had the opportunity not just to know them, mm -hmm. but to have close, good relationships. So I, would, I have a real sense, I know, uh, who they are and what they accomplished. Well said, Fred. Well said. So I, I kind of wanted to dig into your – player personnel background obviously you were you were the gm of the team for you know close to 10 years or right about that 10 year mark 
um, looking at the team right now, sort of put yourself back in those shoes. And obviously you're not as in deep. You don't know all the little nitty gritties of every, every uh, bit of the team around there, but um, you're looking at a team that finally got over that hump for the first time in way too long. And, and you're seeing several key contributors now hitting the free agent market. Um, maybe, you know, looking at names like Justin Turner, Kike Hernandez, um, even beyond that, even like a, a Jake McGee type who who played a big role with the team, especially in the regular season. What might you look at doing uh, in terms of bringing those kind of guys back, or or do you sort of maybe follow the the old Dodgers, you know, franchise thinking of letting players go a little too early, maybe before holding on to them for too long? Uh, you know, just how would you look at? sort of the legacy of those guys and, and, and seeing where they're at in free agency and the Dodgers needs. I, I would look at it from the standpoint, first of all, uh, that the Dodgers are in a great position, not a good position in a great position. And I give all the credit in the world to, um, to Andrew and his staff, these guys have done a tremendous job. When I look at the talent of that team and see the uh, young talent, and then the biggest move at all, uh, without question, was as adding Mookie. And again, just being very candid, I used to ask myself when they weren't quite getting it, who's the leader of this team? Yeah. You know, who, who's, who's the leader here? And in my mind, um, it was Turner because the uh, the other players were too young or didn't have what I saw uh, as those qualities mm -hmm. to be truly the leader. Uh, Clayton clearly was, but when you, when you're a starting pitcher, you can't you don't make the same impact. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I, you can be as great as Sandy or or uh, Fernando or Oral or any other. But you're not there every day, and and the and the pitchers realize that. So, but I, I think to the point that uh, they have some very tough decisions because uh, the work of uh, Andrew and his staff, and I, I've said this, I'm so impressed by the players that they gained from other organizations who weren't prominent players, and the tough position that they had is Kiki, Kike, and Chris Taylor were extremely important parts of this team. Mm -hmm. And if I put myself in another chair of an opposing team, I'm going to be looking hard at those guys because I know how well supplied the Dodgers are. But those players, those two players, are championship players. And, uh, and in picking up uh, Muncie and um, the other catcher, uh, the, the uh, Barnes, is it? Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, those players were really there, and so that they, they that that's going to be tough for them because yeah. uh, Dave knows, Andrew knows that those guys were important parts of this. But now, are we going to be able to uh, to keep them? Uh, in terms of salary and in terms of, uh, well, they, they always seem to find playing time because the <laughs> versatility of those guys yeah. is incredible. So um, I, I uh, uh, as someone pulling for the Dodgers, I, it's nice. I don't have to worry about that because they got some very good minds at work and working <laughs> very hard. So they'll work their way through all of that, what the Dodgers are really going to force other teams to do is to raise their talent level. Mm -hmm. These guys are good. <laughs> uh, I don't want to get carried away, but these guys are good and they're <laughs> going to be good for a long time. Absolutely. And I think the other thing that uh, is going to be very different this off season, and we've already seen it play out. And again, I don't follow it in detail, but players, already uh, non-tendered yeah yeah uh, so there's more in, in many ways uh, i'd like to be in a position to be a general manager of a team that really needs to improve 
because there's going to be a greater supply of players than there has been literally in decades. Teams don't lost money last year. We'll take their word for it. And I, I think we have to take their word for it. Yeah. Um, uh, projections for what's going to happen in 2021. Nobody's going to give you a guarantee. Sadly, we'll probably be in a worse state uh, come January than we are today. I hate mm -hmm. to say it, but if you follow science and the doctors, that's where we're going to be. Mm -hmm. So there, there are, there's going to be a lot of talent there. And by the same token, the Dodgers are going to be able to take advantage of that. Uh, because they may lose someone, but have a greater supply in terms of how they replace that someone. Mm -hmm. So um, when you have young talent and when you have your key players locked up, uh, they did a, a big, big contract to say the least. But uh, the more I saw Mookie, the more he showed me, <laughs> he earned the contract. <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for a 12-year deal, you got to do a lot to get that. Uh, but, yes. uh, oh, boy, did he did he ever this year. I, um, yeah, I didn't realize. Uh, I, I knew in talking to others, but I didn't realize how he played the game every day and every play. I mean, he's, he's beautiful to watch. Oh, yeah. I mean, w as Dodger fans, we, we got to see Mookie a little bit in the 2018 World Series, but I've never personally, before he came to the team, I haven't paid much attention to anything that he's yeah. done, but watching him on the field every single game and how he plays and runs through things every single game, it's like, that is a real life competitor. That's like yeah. the, one of the more driven baseball players that I've ever seen. So yeah, the, uh, really fun to watch. What is it? The adage is, uh, you know, you don't take a playoff. Mookie doesn't take a step off. And no. <laughs> it, is, it is impressive. And to have that guy sort of be your de facto leader for all these young guys, all this young talent you're talking about, Fred, uh, to have that be the guy these kids can look up to for, for the next decade plus. The Dodgers, like you said, not a good team, a great team in a, in a great position. Yep. Um, Fred, we're in the middle of, I guess, what is supposed to be one of the more overhyped uh, <laughs> weeks of the season for baseball fans. You know, during the offseason, there's not a lot going on usually, but during the winter meetings, we expect a lot. We at least expect a lot of rumors to come out, and that's enough to get us excited about baseball again to get us <laughs> through the winter and uh, back into spring training. But obviously – look it looks a little different this year things are you know separate people got to do things over phone and over skype and over zoom like this um you know a little bit different from the time that you did it but you definitely had some really 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 good winter meeting stories um obviously people can look to the kirk gibson signing as your you know your key move for the off season going into the 88 championship season but also during the winter meetings that year you swung one of the bigger three team ish deals that ultimately helped win the championship uh number one wondering if you can talk about that but also number two maybe speaking to what goes on at those meetings because we don't really get a really good insight into those type of things well um uh, i love the winter meetings and i was very blessed uh my first uh winter meetings uh this will date me a little bit <laughs> was in 1969 i believe it was in um, phoenix so being at the winter meetings and seeing that and my introduction to, uh, to baseball, and of course, in different capacities as I went along, I just loved the winter meetings. And uh, because you had a chance to see all the people in the game, and uh, it was just a uh, wonderful memories of uh, about getting carried away of a, a winter meetings in Hawaii when we'd look out the window and say, God, let's end this meeting. Let's get out there in the sunshine, <laughs> the beach, or, or being in Toronto and seeing the sun coming down saying, boy, I hope this meeting goes on because it's freezing out there. <laughs> but certainly um, one of the most memorable me meetings, if not the most, was my first year in 1987. Because we went into that season in 1986 as you know, we, we finished 16 games under 500. Mm. We, we were not a good team. And we needed 
in my judgment, and when I say my judgment, I really mean our judgment because I relied on um, Tommy, uh, scouts, minor league personnel to form my thoughts, all of it was my responsibility. We had to have a shortstop. We had, we had no shortstop. Yeah. We had to um, have a closer. We had no closer. We, we were so bad that Oral came to me in uh, 87, said, I'll volunteer to close. And I said, you'll do that over my dead body is when you'll do that. <laughs> um, we had to have a left-handed pitcher. So when you go into the meetings with three major needs to be a competitive team, and so um, I, when all my years or 10 years, whatever it was, as general manager, the winter meetings, in most cases, I never saw the lobby other than when I walked in and walked out. Uh, I was either in um, my... Uh, room or suite or in another of another uh, general manager uh, uh, or staff meetings that we would have. And so um, trying to fill that need, uh, those needs um, led to discussions where there it came down to two possibilities. One with Toronto, where we had a chance to get uh, three players who could have uh, filled the need or come close in those areas. But the other one was the combination of the um, Oakland A's and the New York Mets. Mm. And a lot of times the winter meetings, the key really is your relationship with the general managers. And Sandy Alderson and I, from the first time we met, were always good friends. And we would run a lot together, general manager meetings or, or winter meetings. So we we knew one another very well and a lot of respect for Sandy because he was a very direct guy. And Joe McElvain of the Mets, I knew and I respected. So it, uh, uh, it came down to um, the Oakland A's with Sandy having two of the players that I felt we really needed. Uh, one was Alfredo Griffin, the shortstop, and the other one was Jay Howe, the closer. And um, when we swung the, or went through those conversations, and then uh, my interest in the left-handed pitcher led to bringing um, Joe McElveen, the Mets, into the discussion with uh, Jesse Orozco. The, the interesting thing about the winter meetings, it doesn't, the trades don't begin at the winter meetings. And I'll give you two classic examples. The trades begin long before that in preparing for the winter meetings. And in this case, the Sandy, the general manager meetings were in Florida. And uh, Sandy and I uh, had gone out to run uh, at this kind of a remote resort place in Florida. And I was to meet that night uh, for dinner uh, with a great scout by the name of Reggie Otero. Uh, Reggie actually had signed Alfredo with Cleveland. And so uh, Sandy and I went out to run and we got lost. By the time we got back to the hotel in the Florida heat, we were dripping wet. And I'll never forget walking into the lobby and there's Reggie in this beautiful white sport coat as prim as he could be. And here's Fred with sweat dripping all of us. And Reggie, I'm so sorry, <laughs> we got lost. I said, uh, I'll change and I'll be right down to have dinner. So I go down and I talk to Reggie. And I, I said, Reggie, uh, we got a chance to uh, make a trade, but it's gonna cost us um, Bobby Welch. Um, but we can get Alfredo. Uh, and uh, we can get Jay Howe. I said, what would you do, Reggie? And he said, Fred, you need a shortstop. He said, you will not find a better team shortstop and leader on the field than Alfredo. They, they don't exist any better than that. And so that was instrumental 
in making that trade. And I've told the story, but the journey of life is um, the night we won the World Series and Reggie saw Alfredo and others celebrating. He went to sleep that night in his home in Florida and never woke up. He passed away that night. Hmm. So those are things, you know, you talk about a trade or from a baseball standpoint, but for me, it became so much more personal about what was involved. And the trade um, nearly got held up because um, we were sending um, Jack Savage, a right-handed pitcher, to the Mets, and he was a pretty good prospect. But I remember my time sitting in Cincinnati with the scout, Carl Lowenstein, and Carl had signed Jack, and he had done well, and now he was up to double A. And I can remember asking Carl at that time, Carl, what, what do you think of Jack Savage? He said, Fred, I don't think he'll ever be a successful major league pitcher. He said, uh, I, I don't think he has a breaking ball that's going to enable him. And I've seen a lot of that in my signing to do it. And so in the, when we had the meeting about this potential trade, there were probably uh, 11 of us, one of the people saying, Fred, we, we can't trade Jack Savage. We can't make this deal. And Carl's words echoed in my ear. And I remember saying, guys, Jack Savage may be a good young pitcher, but he's not standing in the way of this trade because we're going to make this trade. <laughs> so um, the other winter meetings that stands out, and it's a similar story, was uh, when uh, I traded for uh, Eddie Murray. Because uh, after that uh, trade was made, we got into the, I think we were in Atlanta, we got into this glass elevator to come down to the press room. So there's Roland Heeman of the Orioles, Frank Robinson, the manager, Bertie Tevich, the great Baltimore scout, Tommy, Mel Didier, and myself, and before we get to the press room, boom, this glass elevator freezes. So all the guys on the press level come out and point to us and laughing. <laughs> it's pretty funny until the glass starts to uh, fog up and um, to which uh, Frank Robinson said, or maybe it was Bertie Tebbets, it was Bertie, who said, um, I'll tell you one thing, if we get stuck in here, Lasorda, I'm not giving you mouth-to-mouth -mouth recitation. Or the <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, memories of the World Series from that standpoint, um, but of um, uh, deals and and, mm -hmm. um, and all the background. Uh, uh, it's um, it, it's too bad that um, um, more can't be revealed about all that goes behind the trades, but I suppose... Uh, 30 years after anything is fair game. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's funny. You look at that, uh, that, that first deal you're talking about, you know, getting Alfredo Griffin, getting Jay Howell, Jesse Orozco. Sure enough, the Dodgers end up going facing both of those teams that, uh, that postseason, And, and uh, just, it's funny the way that ends up playing out. Um, one of the things I, I did want to bring up is certainly we know, uh, for you know, in 2020, for for LA sports and LA sports fans, it's been a phenomenal year. You got a Dodgers championship, the Lakers win one. You know, <laughs> sort of again parting like it's 1988 because we can never get away from 1988. But uh, you know, sadly, uh, the year that has already been so tough for so many has also come with a lot of great losses to the to the greater Dodger family. You're looking at uh, people like. Jay Johnstone, who I, I, I met through you at, at uh, your last uh, the golf uh, tournament, Sweet Lou Johnson, uh, a true L.A. legend, and Ron Paranowski, uh, most recently Dick Allen, you know, among you know the many other, uh, others. Um, just wondering, for maybe some of the fan base that might not know those names as well, uh, what words could you impart or knowledge could you impart on people just speaking about those guys and uh, you know, just some things that perhaps people might not know about them? Well, the, uh, we, we lost uh, some great people and great contributors to the Dodgers. Uh, some uh, just recently, 
perhaps more behind the scenes, but uh, so important. We lost the great infield uh, instructor, Chico Fernandez, who was part of our minor league system and helped so many people. We lost a great scout, Lon Joyce. Most people don't know that name, mm-hmm. but they name, know the name of Corey Seager. Yeah. Uh, and Lon was a uh, wonderful man, actually a Hall of Fame junior college baseball coach. So, and I talked to Terry Reynolds, our scouting director, about Lon. He last saw him in 2019 when Lon was at a game in the Appalachian League. And typical of Lon, even though he wasn't in the best of health, he stayed for all nine innings <laughs> and then drove two hours to get home. That, that's the story of a scout. That's the story yeah. of a scout behind the player. But um, some of the, 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 the people involved were such great contributors and, and knowing, and you mentioned Sweet Lou Johnson, a, uh, a dear, dear friend, um, and Ron Paranoski, who was um, part of the Dodger tradition of, of pitching coaches uh, coming from the minor league system and getting the major league a uh, job as, um, as Red Adams did, as Dave Wallace did. So there was that uh, tradition. And the one and only Jay Johnstone, who was always there with the lab. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, Sweet Lou, who uh, had a hand in 88. He never got credit, but he had a hand in 88. Because I remember sitting with Lou before I became the general manager at Holman Stadium in uh, Vero Beach. And the Dodgers were playing the Orioles. And uh, this player comes up to bat for the Orioles. And Lou says, I really like this guy, Fred. He said, I, I know him uh, in uh, growing up in uh, Kentucky, as he did. And he said, this, this guy's a better player than a lot of people think. And that player was John Shelby, who was in my mm-hmm. thoughts when we um, ultimately made the trade. So, yeah, we, we've lost, um, we've lost so, so many great people as our, as our country has, as our world has, and uh, we just need to honor uh, their contributions. Absolutely. Um, we also had a little bit of a health scare with Tommy lately, and I know around here, um, you know, 2020 has been a rough year for everybody, but around here, we looked at that and me and Clint kind of looked at each other for a second when we first heard about it and we're like, ah, Tommy, Tommy's not ready to go. Tom, you know, Tommy is a fighter. Tommy's going to have a lot of words for everybody. He'll, he'll be okay. But (laughs) thankfully, thankfully the news seems to be that he's improving. Um, I'm wondering if you've had any conversations with Tommy in the past couple of months and um, you know, what he has ultimately meant in your life, because I know as Dodger fans, uh, Tommy has defined a generation. Uh. I spoke to Tommy about, I'd say, 10 days ago and um, I'm continually texting um, Steve Brenner to, uh, to check on Tommy. Um, but uh, we, uh, uh, we had a good conversation as always and Tommy um, has the same goal. He wants to, uh, to hit triple figures, <laughs> uh, to live to be 100 or more. And uh, so his... Um, his spirit was good, his words were good, and um, he uh, truly is um, a forever legend for the Dodgers because when you talk about the people that uh, we've lost, uh, Tommy touched all of those lives. Uh, Tommy, there isn't anyone who has impacted more lives in Dodger baseball history than Tommy. From the players of uh, yesterday, from the players even before uh, he became the manager, Mm -hmm. to the players of today, and you can see, or I can see even at a distance, the respect that the players of today, today's Dodgers, you guys know because you're there. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, at our... uh, last uh, celebrity golf tournament for City of Hope, that it was such a, um, uh, an honor and a pleasure to present the Celebration of Life Award to Tommy. And that award, of course, um, has the words of Jackie, that a life is not important except 
on the impact it has on other lives. And when I think of Tommy, I think of that. And I think of our uh, friendship going back to 1969 uh, 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 when I was a writer and he was the manager of Spokane. Mm -hmm. And for another day, I'll tell you the story of uh, or may have the day that I played shortstop for Tommy's team, uh, replacing uh, Bobby Valentine. So Tommy and I uh, uh, go a long way back, and I hope we go a long way forward because uh, my thoughts and prayers are always with Tommy and Joe and their family. Yeah, this... yeah we're definitely going to have to hear that story sometime, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> or do you, yeah, do you have the footage? We want to see the scouting footage. <laughs> Red Claire, uh, stop. It, 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 it may exist. We'll have to look for Mark Langell to uh, pull that one out of the archives. Yeah, 